for coming today. It's real loud. Um, <laughs> we're really glad to see all of you. We're glad to be in Fisk. Um, one of our staffers is actually from this area, Sadie, and her husband is on the fire department, so this is near and dear to our hearts here. Um, but we're, we're so glad that all of you came out today. We kind of run all of our town halls about the same. I'm Rachel, I'm the Congressman's Chief of Staff, so if you have any questions afterwards, feel free to come and talk to me or any of our other staff in the back. Congressman will give you a short update on what's going on in Congress and some other things that we're working on. After that, we'll do question and answers. If you filled out the card when you came in and put your question or topic on there, we'll randomly select them on the bucket, and that's the order that we'll take questions. If you didn't get a card to fill out, please raise your hand and the staff will get you one to, to fill out. Uh, once we do that, just a reminder not to talk while someone else is asking a question or clap, and we just want to make sure that everyone in the audience can hear the answers and the questions. Um, and then if we could all rise and say the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks so much. Here's Congressman Grossman. Okay, thank you for being here. First time we've done a town hall in Utica, but experiment works well. Nice turnout. Um, I am Congressman Glenn Rothman. I am your congressman. I'm beginning my fourth uh, fourth year in this job. Uh, we're going to begin off by talking a little bit about the stories that have been in the paper, uh, my experiences uh, in the last year, and then we're going to open things up for questions. I think you, if you all had a chance to fill out a a question. Hopefully, we'll have time to, to get rid of uh, get rid of most of them. I guess the thing that's been in the paper the most the last ten days has been the government shutdown. I don't think the press necessarily did a, a great job explaining exactly what was going on there. To understand the way it works, the federal government works on a fiscal year beginning October first. In no no time since I've been there do we do we pass our budget on a timely basis. As a matter of fact, right now I believe they're even still waiting uh, for. Uh, a budget agreement to see um, how much money we're going to spend. So we're approaching four months into the budget without really having the budget passed. What happens is we know the budget passed, we pass things called continuing resolutions, which just means the government marches along spending the exact same amount they did last year. I never feel that's an overwhelmingly controversial vote. I mean, we eventually will pass the budget. Some things will go up three or four percent here, down one or two percent there. But I think it should be a relatively automatic vote. Um, I took two um, votes on continuing resolutions when Barack Obama was president. I never had any problem keeping the government open when Barack Obama was president. It seems to be just an automatic thing. Not every Democrat. There were some Democrats who voted to keep the government open now. But the vast majority on this continuing resolution, and this was actually, I think, the fourth continuing resolution since October 1st, a lot of Democrats felt that um, doing something about the DACA program was so important that we would shut down the government. I disagree with them on that. First of all, the DACA program has nothing to do with government spending. And there's no reason to me why you shouldn't be able to get an income tax refund because we don't know yet what we're going to do with people who were brought here illegally as children now that they're adults. Um, but in any event, a lot of the Democrats felt very strongly about the issue. In the U.S. Senate, on most bills, including spending bills, it requires 60 votes. So you need, the Republicans have a 51 49 majority, but the Republicans would not have enough votes to keep the government open by themselves. They need help from some Democrats, and there were enough Democrats voting against continuing the government going. So we had a three-day shutdown. I was glad the way um, President Trump handled it. He tried to keep the national parks and national monuments open. Uh, it was before my time, but the last shutdown before that, Barack Obama shut these things down. I didn't think that was fair uh, to the type of people who have been planning their vacations, that sort of thing. So I think Donald Trump handled it as well as he could. Um, and we were able to pass a bill, which is why I'm here now. We passed a bill late in the day on Monday. For a while, I thought uh, this government shutdown continued throughout the week, and we'd have to have my wonderful staff entertain you today, but instead we me. We got back in time, was able to fly out on Monday night. Um, the deal was that we would keep the government open through February 8th. 
Uh, and I know people are hoping that we wound up passing some sort of bill on the DACA situation by February 8th. I personally think that's unlikely. Um, that February 8th deal was cut with the U.S. Senate. I can tell you right now the Republicans in the House of Representatives had not had a meeting to even determine what the House position is yet. There was a, uh, a little working group that got together and then has a plan, and much of that plan has been revealed to us, but normally the way things work in Washington on a major bill like this, we have a couple of private meetings together among the Republicans in the House of Representatives where we can weigh in, where we can ask questions. We have not done that yet. So I anticipate when I fly out next Monday morning having two or three meetings next week, then leadership will have to you know, get together and jiggle things and see if they can get 218 votes. And then they have to worry about cutting a deal with the Senate and cutting a deal with uh, President Trump. So on a personal level, maybe I'll be surprised. They've been surprised before. But I'll be surprised if there's a deal on February 8th. And then we'll have to do another continue, continuing resolution at that time, regardless, because I'm sure we will not have passed a budget by February 8th. Um, as far as DACA is concerned, President Trump has expressed an interest in doing something. I think the overwhelming concern among Republicans is that we get a handle on immigration for the future. Presidents of both parties, this is something that really bothered me about President Bush, uh, they felt the fact that we needed more people to work in this country, the best way to find people, or apparently a major way to find people, uh, was to just let people cross the southern border and, and they were here. To me, what you do is we do need immigrants because we have a shortage of people to work here and some people um, would be much better off in America, but we should be vetting people and make sure every immigrant is a good immigrant. We shouldn't let people in here just because they've got a relative who was here first and above all, we shouldn't let people here just because they snuck across the border. Common sense would tell you if you have two people, let's say, from Mexico, one person is filling out the appropriate forms and waiting 10 years or whatever it is to get here, somebody else is uh, sneaking across the border. Well, there may be fine people sneaking across the border. Overall, we'd be better off with people filling out the forms. And uh, so I think the Republicans, collectively, not all of them, but collectively, we're going to hold out for some sort of fundamental change in the uh, immigration laws around this problem. Again, if we just pass and allow the people who are DACA, DACA immigrants to be legal, right away the old problem is going to start up again the next day. We'll have people coming here illegally. They're going to bring their children. We're going to do the same boat 10 years from now. Immigration law is very important because you have to think of the country you're going to leave your children and grandchildren. To a large extent, that country is going to be determined not only by current Americans and the job they're doing raising their children and grandchildren, but the type of immigrants we let in here. And if we have let immigrants in here who are not going to be appropriately productive, you know, they're going to be a problem to their children, and eventually the whole American dream is going to collapse. So, very important things, and I am strongly in favor of waiting to make sure that we get a good deal. I think there are always some people might want to panic, say we have to keep the government open, any deal better than anything, and um, we have to wrap things up by February 8th. I do not believe that. Like I said, some of these DACA immigrants, they've been in the country for 25 years. I never considered it a crisis that they were illegal under the, the Bush administration or the first couple of years of the Obama administration. It's not a crisis now if we don't reach a deal by February 8th. I just think, you know, keep the government open with another continuing resolution. So that's kind of what's going on with the government shutdown. The next most significant thing that's happened since my last string of town hall meetings was the tax cut. Uh, the tax cut uh, went through a variety of iterations. Uh, there were really four different plans out there. We voted on the fourth plan. Um, the first plan was something uh, that was put together that some Republicans ran on in the last round of elections, I would not have voted for it. I think the original Republican plan aimed too much at what I'll call the investment class. For example, you were taxed at one half the uh, working man's rate if you had interest income. So to me it was kind of aimed at maybe the people who inherited a great deal of wealth and were living off their wealth rather than actually working. Uh, every step of the process I tried to weigh in for more of the working man. Probably the most significant part of the tax cut didn't go to individuals, it went to corporations. Um, and some of the Barack Obama felt we had to do, we had to lower the top corporate rate. Our top corporate rate was 35%. Um, most other industrialized countries were under 25%. In an era in which our business have to compete with businesses abroad, as well as an era in which big multinational corporations have to determine where they're going to expand or if they have to close plants, where they're going to close plants. 
we do not wind up in a position in which we're at a competitive disadvantage. So by reducing the corporate rate from 35% to 21%, we feel we are overall improving the economy. Um, one of President Trump's major goals, which is a good goal, is to bring jobs back to America. And it's hard to imagine you're going to get a lot of jobs for America if tax-wise you're not competitive with other countries. As far as how we're handling uh, personal income taxes, I was very opinionated on that, in part because years ago, before I was doing this for a living, uh, in my lawyer days, uh, I worked for a small law firm, and back in those days, a lot of people went to lawyers to do their taxes, believe it or not. So I was involved in doing taxes, uh, and I did try to weigh in, like I said, not only for the people who work, but on certain lines that I felt they had to keep on the income tax. One area where I was very adamant was I felt we had to retain the, the medical deduction in the income tax. Uh, a lot of Republicans felt as part of tax simplification, a lot of people don't use that line on the, on the form, and they don't use it because your medical expenses had to exceed 10% of your overall income. A lot of people's medical expenses don't exceed 10% of their income. And, and even then, they might not be able to itemize. In my opinion, the people who use the medical deduction are people who really need it. They're going through a tough time in their life. A lot of times you'd use that if people were, say, in a nursing home, or they'd use a medical deduction if they didn't have any insurance for paying a big, you know, twenty or $30,000 bill. Or in today's world, they may be paying a huge amount for health insurance in their own right. I think since these people are in the toughest situation, we should have kept them the medical deduction. I got my wish there, so that was a good thing. Um, and I also kind of did weigh in to, to make sure that uh, more of the deduction uh, or more of the reduction in income tax applied to the individual people. It is hard for me to imagine a scenario in which somebody is making under $100,000 a year, which is a lot of money, $100,000 a year and not getting a tax cut under this plan. I think the only people that I hear from that have pushed the pencil and said, you know, we're mad they're getting a tax increase, are very, very wealthy people. Um, and the reason for that is we capped the amount of the state and local tax deduction at $10,000. I think most people in our society pay less than that, even if you're a little bit over that. Um, you, you may not exceed the increase you have in your standard deduction. Um, or if you're over that, the overall reduction in rates still, still, still gives you a reduction. But if you're making a huge amount of money, um, you're no longer able to deduct your state income tax, and that may be a problem. The people who were maddest about the tax plan who understand what's going on is people in very high income tax states. The only Republicans who voted against the plan were from California, New York, and New Jersey. And the reason they voted against the plan is they have higher income taxes there. And the wealthier people in California, New York, and New Jersey are going to have their taxes go up. And that's why some Republicans from those states voted no. But I think for the average guy, you're going to see a reduction. Hopefully, we'll have it all done. Uh, for those of you who are getting a paycheck, and hopefully, you're, um, hopefully your um, the withholding will be adjusted in February, so you'll see an increase by that time. I would suggest if you're having somebody doing your income taxes, if you can't find a, a website you trust online, ask your tax preparer and see what's what things are going to look like for you next year. Um, as far as other things that are going on, I think the most significant thing is during this time of year, we are not only working on last year's budget, but working on next year's budget. Well, I'll digress for a second. I'll talk about this year's budget a little bit first. I am a little bit afraid of this year's budget, and they haven't really been in negotiations yet, and then I think it is going to be too free spending, quite frankly. Um, as you know, we're all in debt. The average American right now is about $60,000 worth of debt. It's not because we're under tax, it's because we're spending more and more money all the time. Um, a process called sequester, which is probably overall a good thing. We were actually reducing what they call discretionary government spending for about five or six years in a row. Right now there is a feeling, which I share, that we have to spend some more money on our military. If you have any children or grandchildren in the military and you ask them, you're going to find that there's some planes that can't fly, there's some tanks that, they, that won't work because we don't have enough spare parts. I mean, the military right now has been a little bit starved, and it's important that we have a strong military. President Trump proposed giving the military a 5.5% increase.
increase. It's a substantial <laughs> increase in one year. And I, uh, th that would be okay. Um, there was a large group of Republican congressmen who were holding out for a single, who wanted a significantly bigger increase. They wanted over a 10% increase. They didn't get all they want. Uh, but I think we're going to wind up with the Republican negotiating position being an 8-8.5% eight, eight increase in military spending. In order to pass the spending bill, just like these continuing resolutions, you really have to have the Democrats sign off because of the 60 rule in the Senate. Can't really they talked about this yet today. Normally you would think in an elected body, be it the town hall here or the, um, the Oshkosh school board or the Winnebago, County Board of Majority Rules. With one exception a year, and we'll talk about that in a second, the U.S. Senate requires 60 out of 100 votes to get things done. And because there are 51 Republicans and 49 Democrats in the U.S. Senate now, as a practical matter, any spending bill coming out of the Senate <coughs> requires bipartisan cooperation. Okay? And it means when we eventually do pass that bill, which they'll refer to as an omnibus bill, that um, <coughs> Harry Reid, the leader of the U.S. Senate, the majority leader, a Democrat from New York, is going to have to sign off. Traditionally, not Harry Reid. Not Harry Reid. Not Harry, Reed. Uh, Harry Reed, I misspoke. <laughs> I misspoke. I'm sorry. Thanks. We have an on-the-ball audience today. Uh, Chuck Schumer is going to have to sign off. Um, and I have a feeling what will happen is he will say it's okay to have a big eight and eight half percent increase in military spending, but he's going to want a big increase in non-military as well. And you could wind up with a budget going up by six or seven percent, and at a time when the average American or American has sixty thousand dollars worth worth of uh, debt nationwide, that's just unacceptable. But we'll see what's being negotiated uh, right now, pending a, pending a separate budget agreement. Uh, negotiations, at least for the people I've talked to, are not going on the way we handle negotiations in the House. Um, Paul Ryan is very much one to kind of diffuse power away from himself. He's going to have the chairman of something called the Appropriations Committee, as a congressman from New Jersey, and his 12 subcommittee chairmen do the negotiating on it. And I've talked to a couple of them, they haven't even started negotiating yet. So we're a ways away from an overall budget agreement, but I'm a little afraid that when they finally reach that agreement, it's going to be a lot more big spending than something like you or I would want. Uh, but that's going on with that budget. As far as the next budget is concerned, we pass something, first of all, called a budget resolution. And I'll be part of that uh, because I'm on the budget committee. At that time, we will have the ability to pass one bill in 2018 with 51 votes instead of 60 votes. We cannot use that one exception to pass any bill we want. The bill has to be related to what we call mandatory spending. It can be related to government debt, and it can be related to taxes. We get one a year, but in this two-year cycle, we had one opportunity that was kind of left over from the 2016 budget. So we really, I looked forward to having three bills in this two-year cycle that we could pass with 51 votes in the U.S. Senate. The first one was supposed to be the bill repealing Obamacare. I voted for two versions of repealing Obamacare, but as you know, we did not get that done. But if you were following in the paper, you know that in order to get it done, we only needed 51 votes in the Senate. We fell just short, uh, in part because of John McCain's vote last August. So that, that was the first chance, and that was kind of like our 2016 chance at passing something with 51 votes in the Senate. The next opportunity was the tax bill, and the tax bill passed with 51 votes, and that's what we used with our 2017 opportunity. In 2018, I really wanted to do welfare reform. Um, Donald Trump has publicly said he wanted to deal with welfare reform. Paul Ryan wanted to, do with welf uh, to, to deal with welfare reform. I'll talk about that in a second. But there are rumors right now that the Senate does not want to use an all their opportunity to do something with 51 votes in 2018, which if it is so, is I would consider legislative malpractice. Hopefully the rumors going around Washington are wrong. I mean, it's kind of amazing to me that if you are a U.S. Senator and go through all you have to do to get elected to an office statewide, that you would voluntarily say, you know, we're going to give up our opportunity to deal with such important issues in 2018. But that rumor is floating around out there. I've already talked to a couple senators about it. I hope they're not beaten down and think they have to follow their leadership on that. I hope they have a lot of 
senators who are in a fighting mood. I'm sure that Ron Johnson will <coughs> lose him with 51 votes in 2018, and we're just going to have to see what happens. When we return to Washington next week, um, we are going to go on a joint retreat after the State of the Union address, and I'm going to have an opportunity to talk to the Republican senators at that time and weigh in very strongly as far as what should be done. I think our budget committee, which has over 40 congressmen on it, and of that over 20 are Republicans, will have an opportunity to try to publicize this situation and maybe embarrass the Senate into action. I think welfare reform is very important because right now the American welfare system <coughs> discourages people from working and it also discourages people from getting married. Um, if it were up to me, I would have taken up welfare reform ahead of tax reform. I think tax reform will improve the American economy, but I think really the, uh, the moral situation in America is more important than the economic situation. And because I think the welfare reform you're dealing with, with a moral problem, and on the tax reform and an economic problem, I would have gone for dealing with the, with the welfare reform first. I think we do the welfare reform. We have to, first of all, make sure that people don't use welfare as a lifestyle. Everybody goes through a tough time in their life, and if they need government assistance in that tough time, that's okay, but people shouldn't be living off the government for 10 or 15 years in a row. Uh, secondly, if people have the ability to take a job, they should take a job. Um, requirements that you at least be looking for a job or have a job when applied to food stamps in states, Wisconsin and otherwise, have proved very successful in having people all of a sudden say, okay, I'd rather work, or maybe they just disappear and didn't need the benefits at all. So I think that's a good thing to do. You also hear stories of big companies around here having a hard time hiring people, but one of their problems is when people apply for the jobs, they can't pass a drug test. It doesn't seem right to me that if you can't pass a drug test so that you can't work, that because you can't pass a drug test, you all essentially be getting government benefits. So um, I'm fine with uh, drug testing, I'm fine with time limits on the welfare, and I'm fine with work requirements. And perhaps by doing those things, we will stop having uh, such a large segment of the American citizens adapting the welfare lifestyle, which I don't think would be to their benefit anyway. I don't know what I would do if I didn't have a job. It would seem to be spending their whole life watching TV, would not be enjoyable, but even more than that, a lot of these people are parents, and the most important thing, parents give their children as a good example. And when we have people living what I'll call the welfare lifestyle, they're providing a bad role <coughs> for their children. Um, so in any event, that's what's going on with the budget right now. As far as other things that are going on that, um, that I'm dealing with, I am on three committees, and Sometimes most of the work you do in Washington is on the committee level. I am on the budget committee. The, uh, we dealt with that. I'm on something called the government oversight committee, which deals with government scandals. That committee was about the busiest in Congress. Um, in my first two years in Congress, it was very busy about my about the first uh, five months of last year. Then the committee chairman decided to take over his life if you're a C-SPAN devotee. Um, you remember Jason Chaffetz? Mm -hmm. He was from Utah, he did a very good job, he retired to make I think, more money. Um, but now we have a, a new committee chair, it took a while to, uh, for him to, to settle in. I don't think we were as aggressive as the old committee chair was, but we're trying to put pressure on Trey Gowdy to look at more, into more of these scandals, including things you've seen on TV. Uh, but the other committee which I have, I'm on, which I enjoy quite a bit, is the Education and Workforce Committee. We also have a new chairman on there compared to last year. The new chairman is a woman by the name of Virginia Fox from North Carolina. She had worked in administration for the Appalachian State College in, uh, in North Carolina. And not surprising when you have a committee chairman dealing with colleges, she decided to focus primarily on higher education. We are passing a bill that I think will hopefully have two impacts. First of all, right now, student debt is just out of control. Um, and you know, you can run into people relatively young couples between them with over $100,000 in debt. Uh, that's just unacceptable. I mean, it's a situation where they can't afford a house, um, they can't afford to have children. I mean, they're doing what, you know, society told them to do, go to college, get a degree. Um, there are a few things that we can do to try to make sure in the future people don't have that much of a debt. One of them is we require a little bit more counseling. Um, some of the universities feel that some of these kids are, are uh, um, taking out more student loans than they need, and even back when I went to school and the college in the 70s, uh, I think some people took out loans and 
use some of those loans more to have too much fun than absolutely what was necessary. But we also want to uh, begin to crack down on universities that we feel are not doing a good job of, of making sure that their students get jobs. Maybe, this, maybe the kids are in the wrong majors, maybe they aren't helping them get internships. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to say universities that are not doing a, a good enough job in uh, of having their students repay the loans. We'll feel there must be something wrong with those universities or institutions. And we're going to begin to sanction those institutions. And hopefully by doing that, they will care more and make sure that uh, the graduates from those colleges uh, are getting jobs. And quite frankly, sometimes make sure that people who are going through those colleges have a good chance to graduate. I mean, you know, there's sometimes rumors that colleges are taking in kids who they probably know won't graduate, just <coughs> they don't graduate and they're stuck with the debt. So um, we also believe that that will push more people into skills-based education. And uh, we recently had a, a job fair that we sponsored in Fond du Lac. And not only in manufacturing, but in construction, we have a shortage, shortage of people with skills. And that's really where the wealth of America comes from. A lot of times people in these jobs, man, if you go to the pipe trades or something, uh, you can do a lot better than a lot of people who are going to college. So for the benefit of the benefit of the young people and for the benefit of our economy, we have to push people into more skills-based education. Um, like I said, it's also very important for manufacturing. I don't know if I knew this growing up, but it's the second highest percentage of our workforce in manufacturing in the country. Only Indiana has more, and that's just by a smidge. It's Indiana, Wisconsin, a little bit below that, and then a drop before you get to Michigan. So we need good people to work in our factories. Um, oh, and by the way, I should say, this district that I represent, there are 435 congressmen. This district that goes Oshkosh, the other side of the lake, Sheboygan, Manitowoc, down to Ripon, all the way down to Port Washington. There are more manufacturing jobs in this district than any other district in the country. Isn't that kind of interesting? I mean, if you said which congressman has the most manufacturing jobs, you figure probably somebody from Houston or Pittsburgh or Chicago somewhere. No, it's this area, Oshkosh, Fond du Lac, Sheboygan, all the big manufacturers around here. You see all these factories, you just kind of figure, well, that's the way it is all over the country. <coughs> we do have more here than anywhere else. So. Um, I do kind of look out of manufacturing, and I, I always looked out for manufacturing as a state legislator as well, because that's where your wealth comes from. You know, I used to be a lawyer years ago, but your country's not wealthy because you got a lot of lawyers. Your country's wealthy because you have a lot of factories, right? So, um, in any event, that's what's going on in the Education Committee. I'm trying to what else I can mention. Uh, some of these people ask me about Donald Trump. I've only had one conversation with Donald Trump since he was sworn in. I think overall he's doing a very good job, but I do think he tweets too much, and I use my two minutes when I talk to him to, to point out it would be better if he wouldn't tweet so much. I think he yeah, would be more effective if he did. It's unprofessional, so I think when you tell people he's doing a good job, people think, well, if he's tweeting so much, that doesn't sound like, you know, um, my opinion of that. I also think he wouldn't tweet so much. He'd be more popular. It'd be easier for him to get some of his programs through Congress if he was more popular. You know, a president is popular rating is at 45, 50 percent. You know, people want to stand with them and get stuff done. Your popularity falls under 40 percent. Sometimes politicians vote against you just because they can and um, that sort of thing. So I obviously was not entirely successful when I talked about it. I will collect the anecdotes and hopefully I'll get another two or three minutes to talk to him sometime in 2018. Maybe I'll have a better pitch next time. So that's it. Now we'll go into the uh, portion of the program which we answer questions. Rachel, who is my chief of staff, has a bucket full of questions, and we'll see how many we can get through before we move on. Mark Block. Mark. I think before we do something drastic on climate change, and, and um, first of all, I think America has done a lot uh, to reduce pollutants already. 
Okay, I mean, if you look at any standards uh, compared to say when I went to high school, everything, ozone, um, particulate matter, way less than in the past. So we've done a huge amount, and you know, you measure air pollution today compared to what it used to be, way less. Um, but before we do something drastic, I think we have to see what's going on, whether there is climate change. I mean, when I was your age in the 1970s, I remember the magazines like Newsweek and that sort of thing talking about global cooling. And I remember a time where they'd say, oh my goodness, we're all going to starve. It's going to be so cold in Canada. They won't be able to grow wheat in Canada anymore. What a catastrophe. Well, you know, these were all experts and PhDs, and they all seemed to say what they were doing, and it turned out they were 100% wrong. <coughs> Throughout time, we've been hot years, cold years, hot decades, cold decades, uh, even hot centuries, warm centuries. So I don't think we have to do anything dramatic right now until we find out what's going on. Ronald Meyer? I'll say one other thing on the last question, too. A lot of the experts, if you go back and, and say how hot was it supposed to be in 2018, a lot of what the experts said in the year 2000 or 2001, you look, their predictions didn't come true. So you know you can't always trust the experts. Which is a good thing throughout life, by the way, to remember you can't always trust the experts. Uh, my question relates to uh, how things work, working with other people in the, Cong in the Senate and the Congress, with all the conflict that there seems to be publicized all the time. Is it actually that bad? No, I don't think it's that bad. First of all, I mentioned to you that it takes 60 votes to pass most things out of the Senate which means the Senate, uh, the Republicans and Democrats have to get together. Uh, until the tax bill, every significant bill that passed in my first three years in Congress was bipartisan. Okay, three big omnibus bills, which would be the equivalent of our budget, all bipartisan. I think the first one passed right before I got there, but all those were bipartisan. We had a big Medicare bill. Uh, which I think was maybe too expensive, but it was a Medicare reform bill that was bipartisan. Big transportation bill, most significant transportation bill in years, that was all bipartisan. Um, <coughs> most significant bill since George Bush is no child left behind, that was bipartisan. I sat on the conference committee uh, because it was required to be bipartisan in the Senate. Um, we met with the Republican or Democrat senator from Washington to put something together. So almost all of what we do is bipartisan. I'm trying to think why the press doesn't focus on it. And I guess it is because when people vote on something bipartisan, it usually means Paul Ryan and Nancy Pelosi are voting the same way. So there, there's no, we will have to ask the reporter, we should bring them up here and see what they have to talk about it, but we're not gonna do that. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it obviously is of more interest if you have a contest, you can say this side is taking this position and that side is taking that position. Uh, on a personal level, I think people get along very well. I mean, you know, you'll go back, they'll talk about the weather, what you do, you know, on your so-called week off, or um, for whatever reason, they talk about football a lot. And they ask, mm -hmm. uh, those congressmen all talk about you know, your football team, or that football team. But I think uh, socially, people get along very well up there, and most things are done in a bipartisan fashion. By the way, Sometimes you don't always want bipartisanship. I mentioned that I think the budget we're spending right now is going to be too free spending. And one of the reasons is one way you can get the Republicans and Democrats together is just keep spending more money to make everybody happy. And you got to look out for that as well. But right now under the current rules, most things are bipartisan and on a personal level they get along. Occasionally, occasionally a couple of the 435 get all kind of rude and yell and yell and yell and that makes the news. But it's only a couple of them and not that often. Pam Cundy? Um, I originally wrote something about DACA, and I guess um, Representative Brooklyn asked that. But as you were talking and, and said how they have lowered the corporate tax rate, right. and how this is going to improve um, maybe um, hiring right. or wages for those workers, right. how do we have evidence that corporations are going to do that? Because I can't remember the exact meeting, but there were several CEOs at this meeting, and I can't remember the gentleman in the administration who asked this, but said, how many of you are going to follow through, uh, raise your hand, how many of you are going to follow through and um, use these lower 
corporate race to do anything, and very few hands went up. How can we hold these okay. corporate people respond, um, accountable for what's going on? Somebody's got to rely on common sense. And by the way, you know, at least with regard to manufacturing, President Obama was for a <coughs> corporate rate as well. Okay, if we have companies deciding where they're going to set up shop, and the corporate rate is 35% in America and whatever, 15% in Ireland or something, we are obviously at a competitive disadvantage. And when they decide, like I said, which plant to close, which plant to expand, the United States is going to be on the short end of the stick. Taxes are also a cost of doing business. And when an American company is competing against a European country or an Asian company, and our company is paying more in taxes than the Asian company or the European country, uh, it makes our product cost more. It won't be <coughs> product. Right, but if we okay. lower this corporate rate, then we should be more competitive. Correct? That's exactly right. That's exactly so what we're doing. How we And, and uh, well, we're not going to run the corporate rate. <coughs> I think you can see from the stock market, not the stock market's a be all or end all, but That's obviously true. people invest in the stock market thinks it is going to be good for American business. And I think if we had not passed that law <coughs> change, I think you would have seen a dramatic drop in the stock market with all the problems that would have caused as people's 401ks or investment accounts fell it would have been very bad for the economy. And I think one of the reasons the economy is so booming, one of the reasons, um, is the anticipation of the tax cut and the tax cut itself. So with one more thing, is President Trump going to lead by example and bring his businesses back to the United States? Um, I'm not familiar with his business. You, could, you would have to admit that I think one of his primary things he ran on <coughs> was improving the American business climate and having more jobs come back. And I think there is already some evidence of, of things being made in Mexico that are now are or will be made in the United States again. Kurt Reese? Yeah, as you can see, I'm a volunteer with AARP and just wanted to thank you for uh, passing the Raise Family Care Act. I think it's very important to us. It's to keep people out of uh, care institutions right. where they don't want to be in them and keep them in their homes. Right. Thank you. Thomas Weber? Yeah. Okay. Ah, uh, thank you. We're a group. We're a group. You're a group. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we got the band together. Um, <coughs> thank you very much, uh, Congressman, for having today's town hall. Uh, we represent Ray H. Fuller, DAV Disabled American Veterans Chapter 17. Uh, DAV, as of 2017, will have been around 100 years. And you have chap you literally have chapters throughout your district. And two things that we're, we're looking at is one is uh, H.R. 1472, and uh, Alabelle and I, and you discussed it last September, and that's the <coughs> VA Caregiver Act. Currently what happens, like an example, I'm a 9-11 veteran. Um, if I have, you know, injuries and so forth that my wife needs to, to stay with me or a caregiver needs to help me out, uh, the government will help fund that. You know, where they'll have a, a monthly stipend, uh, they'll have access to Champess, um, some education, respite services, those type of things. Uh, the challenge is, is what about the rest of the veterans? It's somewhat discriminatory in nature. It's what about the Vietnam veterans? And, and where it's a win-win is if you have that caregiver with that family member keeping them in the home, that ensures that they, they don't go to other facilities. So I think from a, a, a fiscal standpoint, it's, it's kind of the smarter way to go. Uh, AARP, the Elizabeth Gold Foundation, all of the rest of the veteran service organizations do support this. And I know VA, the VA chairman, I think it's Phil Rowe, in February, this will be coming back up uh, on the radar screen. Mm -hmm. So we're just asking your support. Okay, I'll talk, to, you can give me a call. I'll talk to Phil when I get back next okay. week and let you know what he says about bringing it up. And then there's just one more, that, that, and this one's kind of a near- He's a great guy though, he's one of my better friends up there. Oh, good, I like to hear that. And then just one other thing, uh, I guess I have one. And that's uh, DA supports HR 1279. 
and that's helping veterans exposed to the burn pits. And this one's real personal for me. Uh, you know, you've heard of situations with, with Vietnam veterans with Agent Orange where for years it was denied and then, hey, there's something going on here. You've heard the same with uh, Desert, Skull, Desert Storm with uh, uh, <coughs> Gulf War Syndrome, I believe it is. For the nine, yeah, yeah, for the for the nine eleven guys, I mean, I had fifteen different exposures to burn pits, and I have the paperwork with me right now. Uh, we're seeing people that you know are having lung cancer. Uh, I now have asthma. I didn't have that before I went in the military. We're having people with COPD, and so I'll leave some information with your staff, but. That's something that means a lot because, like I said, I, I ended up with 15 different exposures. Okay, I'll, I'll try to read it on my way to the next time. Okay, right and away. thank you so much for your time. Thanks for showing up. Ellen Hess. Thank you. Okay, Ellen Hess. Oh, I don't know what. Um, I'd like to know what, other than the tax bill, what have you done for the average American person, not companies, and maybe for seniors that don't have. Um, income. I'm a senior, I'm retired, and uh, you know, and so we have a, a tax cut for a few years, which I look at the big picture, and I personally don't like this tax bill that you passed. Um, I think too much emphasis is on the companies, and, and our economy has been going fairly well. It's, you know, was way down there. But what have you done for seniors and for the average American person? Well, you we know? feel a strong economy is good for the average American person. And as I said, I think the tax cut, it's hard to imagine a scenario, maybe you had a big casualty on theft loss or something, it's hard to imagine a scenario in which somebody making under $100,000 a year is not uh, getting a tax cut. I think there are all sorts of average people who have retirement accounts and mutual funds, stocks, and that sort of thing, and that will benefit them. But above all, our economy, while it was good, was not growing at what it traditionally grows at. And as we want your children or grandchildren to have jobs, a growing economy is good for everybody. I think what you're kind of talking about, do I have a specific program in which I'm giving you something? And, yeah, I, I mean, when I think of trying to help the average guy, I think an economy which is growing the degree to which you could realize your potential here in America, to keep America the land of opportunity. And um, that benefits everybody. It presumably benefits, like I said, your children or grandchildren. I think most people that I know who are retired, the major thing they want is good things for the next generation. And we hope that's what we try to do. I think uh, we've also uh, repealed some regulations that were going to go in effect that were uh, maybe perceived somewhat anti-business. I think Donald Trump himself has appointed more, um, more freedom-oriented cabinet members. I think that's also something that's improving the economy. We did, um, maybe this would affect older people. I did vote for something called 21st Century Cures Act, which will be more money for research on diseases. And there's been an increase in spending on research for diseases, and I think and so far as diseases like Alzheimer's disproportionately affect older people, and you could say that disproportionately affects people who are what you would call senior citizens. Lawrence Hildebrand? Yeah. So my main concern uh, today that brought me here was about DACA and chain migration, and I understand with the government shutdown and everything that's going on in everyone's minds, but I know that's going to be something that's just, uh, discussed in the future as well. I know that uh, Chuck Schumer actually had uh, protests outside this house and everything uh, pertaining to the chance of all 11 million and everything else. My main question about that is, I mean, as far as the quality of life for average Americans out of high school and college, as you stressed before, you know, not all the time you're going to get out of college and hop straight to a, a good paying job or anything. But even Americans straight out of high school, going to manufacturing isn't always the best choice, but sometimes it's all we really have left for us. So, you know, you go into manufacturing and everything, but 
then at the same time you hear, okay, well, in the next decade, automation is going to be taking down all these jobs. So with automation killing the jobs and bringing in, potentially with chain migration, millions of new people into the country, then what will happen to all these people once automation you know, kills plants or it's just skilled technicians maintaining robots or anything else? Well, first of all, as you know, I'm not in favor of chain migration. And I think one of the goals we're going to have if we ever do pass a DACA bill is to put an end to that. I mean, I think our goal should be every immigrant is a good immigrant. I think if you talk to the people, I think you kind of, you seem kind of dismissive of manufacturing jobs, like maybe that's all I can do is manufacturing. A lot of times people in manufacturing jobs are, are doing better than people in non-manufacturing jobs. Manufacturing is, I think, the part of society that determines whether we're a wealthy society or not, right? In order to have a wealthy country, you have to produce something. It's either manufacturing or agriculture or mining. And like I said, this state is kind of manufacturing above all. I think if you, well, you know, there's some manufacturing jobs more skilled than others. If, if you go in and um, get good skills there, I think you're going to find some people in manufacturing are making a lot more money than people are not in manufacturing. And right now, almost every facility you look at, one of their concerns, and maybe their number one concern, is finding more skilled people. And again and again, they'll tell you a lot of the skilled people they have are in their 50s and 60s, and they're panicking, they're panicking, wondering where they're going to find people to do the work in 15 or 20 years. And the same thing, by the way, is true of construction. Um, like I said, you know, you're not a wealthy society because of, of the number of lawyers you have. We need people to, to, to do the work that makes us a wealthy country. So. Um, I would not be dismissive of manufacturing. I think one of the problems we have in the country is there have been too many like guidance counselors and that sort of thing. We have been dismissive of manufacturing. That's one of the reasons why we're going to be stuck in the situation we are right now. I mean, I'm, I, I so, understand where you're coming from. I mean, I, I'm a native of Sheboygan County, actually. I recently moved up here. And I spent about five years working at the between Venus Manufacturing and Sheboygan Falls and the EMAC Foundry and Sheboygan, um, that basically the EMAC Foundry making car parts and everything. So it's not so much being dismissive of the jobs, it's the fact that if we're bringing in all these new people into the country and some of the jobs are going to be dissipating, I mean, I'm not saying it's all unskilled labor that might be coming into the country, but for Americans that just go to high school and do manufacturing like I did, or as a reservist, uh, which I also do on the side in the Army Reserves, you know, if, if my primary source of income kind of dries up, all of a sudden there's this massive pool of labor, so what, what exactly would we be doing? Um, right now, like I said, we have a labor shortage in this country, and uh, maybe we can solve some of it through welfare reform, but we're a long way um, from, I think, dealing with that problem. Furthermore, if our immigrants are good immigrants. I think they cause the economy to expand. Years ago in this country, uh, immigrants usually economically outperform the native born, or their children outperform the native born. People <coughs> talked about the idea that people come to America really because it's the land of opportunity and work extra hard. So I would hope <coughs> that in the future our immigrants even form new businesses and cause the economy to grow all the faster and create more opportunities there would be the goal of, uh, if we get the right immigrants coming here. Nick Sunker. Morning, Congressman. Uh, we live at a time of record corporate profits and income equality we haven't seen since just prior to the Great Depression. Now, you say at all your town halls that we're broke as a country, yet you voted for a tax bill that decreased the corporate tax rate from 35 to 21 and is adding one and a half trillion dollars to the national debt with absolutely no way of paying for it. How do you square those contradicting messages? Okay. Um, we want the economy to grow quicker. Okay. When your corporate tax rate is not competitive with tax rates in other parts of the 
parts of the world, you're not going to have the economy growing at the higher rates that traditionally have been growing in America. So the purpose behind the tax cuts uh, is to have the economy grow more and in the end wind up with, as the economy grows, as more people are working, as people are getting raises, uh, you're going to get more income tax receipts in. You know, if you grow the economy by one or two points more uh, without the tax cuts, um, you wind up making progress against the deficit. I, as I mentioned before, it kind of runs together what I said here, what I said with the last meeting. But I think the huge growth in value probably caused an increase in capital gains tax receipts last year. I know the state of Wisconsin, which is just one state, but I know um, they have been getting in more money in state tax receipts than they thought they were getting get in a few months ago. Why do you think that happened? It's because the economy grew. And if you have a growing economy, you are going to get more tax receipts in there. Okay? So, um, as uh, you mentioned, the um, an income gap, and I told you, we are, I did what I could to direct the income tax cuts of the working guy, the people who, the few people who are mad, genuinely mad, who looked at their taxes, that have contacted me are the wildly wealthy. You know, people who, we had special uh, lower rate if you own a business, but like I said, people who are making a lot of money who are working for somebody else, I think that's where you're going to see a few people are going to have to pay more, and that's certainly true of states like California and New York. I guess my my question is, how can you claim that we're broke when you're adding a, a trillion and a half dollars to the national debt? That, that if your economy grows, you will not be adding that much to the debt. See what I'm saying? I mean, when you when you when you cut your income tax and everything was static, if it was static, you would have an increase in debt. But insofar as it causes your economy to grow three and four percent instead of one or two percent, that's a huge difference in the amount of income tax revenues you get in. And that one and a half trillion dollar figure does not take that into account. James Sadler? James, James Sadler? I'm right here. Do you have a question? I didn't really sign up for a question. Okay, I can't that's fine. Listen, but, uh, oh. I, uh, you know, uh, I think some of the problem right now, uh, he was talking about before uh, finding people to do the jobs. And I think in our society we have right now, with uh, computers and whatnot, because I was an iron worker for, for 40 years, union iron worker, and the trades right now are hurting. I go to the meetings once in a while, now that I'm retired, of course. Uh, if you don't let some of these immigrants in, you don't have anybody to do those jobs. They're willing to be the, the laborer, or in your dairy business right now, they're the ones that are willing to do the work. The people we have in our up and, up and coming uh, workforce aren't into that. Uh, I can tell by my grandson, they're never going to want to do anything like that. So I guess that's just my, my thought on it. I I'll, I'll, I'll agree with you. There's a major yeah. problem we have in construction. So if we don't... Fighting people to work. How do you limit the people coming into the country to scream and say, well... Because I was never that in school. Yet I got a lot of common sense. I think the common sense went out of people's minds. You don't have people with common sense anymore. You're exactly right. <laughs> One of the top mechanics for Oshkosh Motor Truck I, I, never had any schooling in mechanics. And yet they send them all over the world to figure things out. So inside, who's coming and who, who can come into this country and who can't. Right. I, I, I will agree with all you're saying, and I, I will say you can have four degrees, and if you don't have common sense, <laughs> what good is it? You're right, you're right, you're right. Paul Baker? Um, all of us up here receive our, at least some of our care from the VA, and they're always talking about elevating costs and trying to control costs. But for a lot of the medications the VA sends out, they only send them in 30-day increments rather than 90 days like a lot of health care plans do. If they would increase their medications to 90-day segments, they would eliminate a lot of shipping and a lot of labor 
uh, of course, in their uh, pharmacies. And they wouldn't have to change the size of the bottles because they sent big bottles for 10 pills on um, I haven't heard that before. We'll take the concern back and we'll talk to the VA about it. Thank you again for doing the town halls, and um, thank you for having us do the, the mm -hmm. Pledge of Allegiance, which um, was really meaningful for me, and I appreciate the fact that we have veterans here. My dad was a Navy man, and, um, and so I would really hold the, the flag and, and America in really high, um, high esteem. And I'll be up front. I'm a moderate Democrat. I'm not from right here. But um, we like to go around, not we Democrats, but my friends, we go around and we tape these because we want the constituents, this is a really broad district, so we want the constituents to, to the people that live near me to be able to see um, Glenn, who we really appreciate <coughs> that you go around. Okay, with all that said, yesterday afternoon I was in Campbellsport and there was a, uh, 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 there was a minister in the audience and he asked a question, then as I was driving home, I was so struck with his question and your response that I went online and I, I mean, I went to my tape and I wrote some things down. And he was concerned about, he was an independent, he voted for neither Hillary Clinton nor Donald Trump. And he was concerned about basically Trump's character. And he said, um, a strong case could be, can be made that he's a pathological liar, that he's a racist, he bragged about groping women, he's being accused of having an affair with a prostitute while he was married. Um, he mocked a disabled human being. He's spoken unkindly of ethnic and religious minorities. He's delusional, erratic, impulsive, and irrational, and he uses vulgar, he often uses vulgar language. Um, and so he wanted to know your thoughts on that. Um, he wished that, the, the minister said, I wish more Republicans, including you, would stand up to him and say enough is enough. Um, and at that point, the Reverend got some applause because there were people in the audience that agreed. And then your response was what sort of interested me. You said, on some of your interpretations of what he said, I think a strict reading of Donald Trump's words, you said his words, but Donald Trump's word, would say you were wrong. And I wanted to, I kind of wanted to go back to that and ask you about it, because when I went home and took a look at it, I mean, it's documented that he's up to lie number 2,000 um, at basically one year out, which is like five lies a day. Um, and then it's also documented that on at least 13 occasions he's distributed, he's made racist comments. Um, it's also documented, you talked yourself about the use of the tweets, which I would call at least impulsive behavior. Um, he bragged about groping women like we all saw that on the news. Um, he has been accused of an affair, but you know, you're, you're, you're not guilty until you're proven guilty. Um, most of us have seen him mock a disabled human being. Um, we've heard him speak unkindly of ethnic and religious minorities. And you, you suggested to the minister that he go on the internet and look at other interpretations of things. So I'm, I'm interested, I mean, where, are you saying that all of this documented stuff is fake news? I am saying that, and I, I'm not going to go through each one of those instances because you can read long articles on each one. I think on some of the things you're talking about, actually almost all the things you're talking about, if you get on the internet, you will feel when people, you will find out when people say Donald Trump made fun of disabled people, that that is not accurate. That, that is somebody's interpretation of what he did. It is an interpretation that is hostile to Donald Trump and is not, not right. So when you, I, you, when you saw the film of him imitating the reporter, you didn't think that was offensive? I, I think would, it was a reporter, I'm sorry. You, I would go online, and I think what you will find out if you are open-minded in research is that Donald Trump was not making fun of a disabled person, that that was somebody's interpretation, and that interpretation is wrong. I, I'm not going to go in and look for it right now, but... Um, I did not look that up last night, because I remembered it. it. I'll, I'll look it up tonight. And it's, it's not you know, right on point as far as... Uh, you know, well, it's not going to vote on that sort of thing, but I think what you've got to do is there are a lot, when Donald Trump says something, there are people who are going to interpret to his detriment, and there are people who are going to spend some time with it by the time they get looking at it. Uh, the people who are interpreting it to his detriment, to, to my satisfaction, are being proved wrong. 
And um, I, I know there are a lot of people who um, who don't like him. And one of his problems is he kind of shoots from the hip. And the reason politicians talk like politicians, I don't know why I talk, but uh, the reason politicians talk like politicians is because, you know, if you talk like a normal person, you can always take what you say out of context or, or take it wrong. And, um, and, Donald, and, and of course, some of the things he says, he doesn't even know he, he taped at the time. But I think on most of the things that you talked about, if you look around enough on the internet, there's another interpretation of what he said. Colin Hughes? Nothing. Okay. Uh, Don Nussbaum? Um, I'm just wondering if you have talked to Ron Johnson since his comments about the secret democratic meetings. No, I have not. Or if you have any comments? No, and I, as I understand it, um, I think if you listen to the news today, maybe you'd have a different interpretation of what he said yesterday. So, but I have not talked to him now. Uh, Barbara Hughes? I don't have a question. Okay. But thank you for all that you're sharing with us. Sure. We're well, glad to be here. Anita Meyer? I'm Anita Meyer, and I have an artificial voice box, so there's going to be a pause before you hear this coming out of my mouth. The Pentagon monitors everything that I do, and this is the end. I lost my voice box in 1991, serving our country in Iraq, doing a job that I wasn't trained to do, but I do these 2,193 bombs before one went off in my case. I sent a picture of the CT scan to your office and received a letter that stated, case closed. But I'm more concerned today about the chemtrails in our air. Do we have air support to support the fact that we manufacture the military equipment here? Because I am very concerned about driving from Nina to Oshkosh and having my vehicle covered in jet fuel. I'm not sure if you were aware that this is going on here in this area, but I've also been face to face with 23 Russians parachuting to our ground. I think this needs to be addressed and we need to get our military up to speed as quickly as possible. But I have been fighting for five years to get my voice box replaced with delay after delay after delay. The Veterans Administration from the state of Wisconsin has <coughs> not replaced the doctor that used to work on our voice boxes. There are 38,000 of us that have these voice boxes here. We are fighting to try to just get this replaced. As you can see, I'm almost completely mute. And someone else is getting paid to be my voice. I am a United States Marine. I gave a lot for this country. I did not come back here and say, woe is me. I came back here and said, whoa, you put me back together. Let me do the best I can. I started my own residential remodeling business, which was shut down because I got divorced. My veteran's ID was stolen. I got a job with FEMA in California, but they can't put me on payroll because that veteran's ID has 13 death certificates tied to it. I really am not here for my own personal. I am more concerned about these people in our air. Who are they? And why do we have chemtrails with them? I'm sure we need to take us back to Washington so that we can get the funding to get air support. I appreciate your time today. And I really do think that you've done a lot of great things to keep your economy flowing. And I think that you have been wise in your decisions of how to put these corporate uh, business problems back into a better perspective. Than they were. Okay, thank you. Um, because of so much you're dealing with is a personal matter with regard to how the VA is treating you, I'm going to have you talk to my staff. Is there anyone 
want to be with her now before we take off. And I know we've got another room back here somewhere where you can where you can talk. Um, okay, thank you for your service. Patty Dolexen. Medicare and Social Security, etc., follow. And uh, President Trump, I think in his, in his uh, campaign, said that he was going to protect that. Well, he's, he's not doing that. So, what, what are you going to do about that? Uh, I, I'm not sure what you mean by he's not protecting it. Um, I have not seen him do anything that would indicate that he's going to do anything significant with Medicare or Social Security so far. And I still take his statements at face value. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, you can't predict the future, but he said what he said, and I do not anticipate voting in the near future on any changes to Social Security or Medicare. That's all I can say. Um, I don't we don't. I haven't heard Donald Trump say anything else either. Ty yeah. Kevin Fritz? Yeah. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, I see you quite often throughout the summer at picnics and fairs, and I'd like to thank you for your presence. I've got a couple questions. Uh, NAFTA, uh, I'm a farmer. Uh, we're being affected by the unfair trade of dairy. And I'd like to ask what's happening with the definition of a milk in our dairy cases. Does the the milk products being put in the dairy milk to regular milk? That's what's, what's happening with uh, we used to get that? In Green Bay, but when I think Tammy Baldwin is bringing out a bill at one time. Um, uh, we so are going to have a new agriculture uh, bill. Uh, we anticipated passing sometime in 2018. I'm not on the agriculture committee. I would assume sometime in the next two or three months. We're going to be briefed by the agriculture chair, and the rest of us will have an opportunity to weigh in. Um, I always do what I can to help the farmer around here, and be happy to uh, have you with my staff. You know, hear what your opinions are as far as what I should weigh in on that egg bill. Obviously, we have a very complicated problem in the uh, milk area, and that is we have big overproduction right now. As you guys keep getting more efficient and more efficient, and more efficient you become without an increase in demand, uh, there's a problem. But um, one thing, uh, I don't know if you know this, but one day's production a week needs to be exported. can definitely reach out. That's what that's what the farmers, depending on, is the exports. And I think Donald Trump has made me aware of that. When I look at this stuff. I know um, when people when people talk about trade, they've got to realize we're doing for the agriculture sector, not only for dairy but other things as well. Um, the amount of our, our product that goes abroad is, is very large, and I, they're they're um, they're talking right now about the value of the dollar going down. There plus and minuses to that. I hope that it'll move things a little bit in the right direction. I don't know if people understand the cheaper our dollar, the more exports we export. Right. And when our dollar gets strong, strong, we less exports. Export less. Right. And that's been part of the problem, too. And I don't think that's even necessarily been our country's problem so much as other countries have done. done not a very good job in their, their, their currency drops. And as our currency, um, uh, you know, if our currency drops a little bit, it'll be very good for exports, not only for agriculture, but for manufacturing as well. Said it would take six weeks to over George Gillis? I have had five yeah, job me. offers. I have, uh, but it doesn't seem to bring up as far as women have. And seriously, uh, California, 230,000 a year. You used the long journey home as a guide for a congressional legislation. Uh, I would love to work. <laughs> and I'm only, uh, what are you going to do to ensure that women veterans seeking VA um, care have time to access a comprehensive primary care service 
and that con Congress enacts legislation addressing identified gaps in benefits and service for women veterans? Um, I think as far as general overall service for veterans, I've been supportive to alternatives other than the VA. You know, as far as doing distinguishing between men and women veterans, I'm not aware of any out there on that right now. But I know across the board, I think more alternatives always mean superior care for everybody. Not only finding care closer to your home, um, but I have sometimes felt in the past it is a tragedy that sometimes there is better care in non-VA facilities. And I've been supportive in allowing people to go to more non-VA facilities, not only because it's more convenient, like I said, but I think sometimes it results in, in superior care. And um, that's in general what I try to do with regard to health care for vets. My question was Thank you. Thank you. Don Bruno? I originally was going to ask you about Doc, but I want to ask, since you're on the oversight, why is uh, Peter, uh, Peter Strzok, his mistress, still working at the FBI? Now, my understanding, on when J. Edgar Hoover was in, G-men could not have affairs that were above reproach. The man is texting messages against a president who is seated one election, like it or not, and he's doing all this texting with his girlfriend, having meetings with uh, Mr. Cave, who shouldn't even be in. Why are they still there, Glenn? With all due respect, if any of us did this stuff in a private sector job, we would be bounced out the door. We have introduced bills making it easier to get rid of federal employees. One of the reasons why I think the federal government across the board is so frustrating to deal with, and we have hearings on this, for whatever reason, a lot of them focused on sexual harassment. But federal employees just doing horrific things, and they shuffle them somewhere else. Uh, now, this this new information is relatively new, so maybe they will be able to get rid of her. Uh, and I guess I'll find out when I get back. Why the Attorney General, he's in charge of the Justice Department, in charge of the FBI. They still have security clearances. It's said today on the radio, these guys could have had their information. I mean, they, and I, I don't understand this. You have, I worked for Oshkosh Corp at one point. My security clearance was so tight, I had to watch, I would go to jail if I talked about some of the projects I've worked on. These guys are blabbing about stuff that shouldn't be, and technically, they should, I mean, they shouldn't have a security clearance. He shouldn't be in H, and they put him in HR. Last it's place, the guy's fooling around with cheating on his wife, and he's putting on charge of HR. I mean. It's a relatively new story. Um, yeah, but Jeff Sessions needs to get off his butt and do his job. I mean, he's so wishy-washy. Why is he even attorney general? <laughs> I will weigh in when I get back. And I agree with you on many things. It is amazing what you would do as a federal employee and nothing happens to you. And that's one of the reasons why I, one of many reasons why I think whatever anybody says, let's let the federal government do something. You don't want the federal government to do it. We've introduced legislation making easier to get rid of bad federal employees. Uh, for the reasons I said, it's very difficult to get out of the Senate because it requires 60 votes. I think um, one of the things that Scott Walker was blind on when I was in the state legislature was Act 10. But the best thing about Act 10 is it made it easier to get rid of a, a bad local employee, to get rid of a bad school teacher. And you look all he went through to do that. But they eventually got to do, or I hope eventually do something like that at a federal level. It's going to be much more difficult to do on a federal level because it's going to require 60 votes in the Senate. But I can tell you, I've co-sponsored that legislation. I voted for that legislation. When we get back to Washington next week, I'm specifically going to ask about well, the Well, that affects you guys as well because you guys do have a separate rules, as you know, in the House. You, I mean, not you personally, but you guys had a fund set up so for the harassment that we just found out about. But, you know, guys in the Congress don't have to follow the same you know, uh, Social Security, certain rules, as the private sector does. 
I mean, you guys do have separate rules. I hope you guys are going to put that so that the House and the Senate staff have to follow the same rules as everybody else. Our, our staff is in kind of, actually right now, with regard to health care, my staff is in a, a worse position than other federal employees. I mean, my staff has to be through Obamacare and other federal employees don't. No, I'm not talking about that. Yeah. I'm saying if they don't behave themselves, you guys yeah. can easily dismiss no, you're right. That's what I'm asking. You're right. That's right. You are right there. Benjamin Kraminar? Yeah, right here. Uh, thank you very much for taking some time with us. As a, a local higher official, I work for the municipality here. We all know that our roads, infrastructure, transportation, everything is very poor. Um, I, I really absolutely appreciate the, the emphasis on federal military spending. That's very important for our, our government. But how is... Uh, the federal government working with states and local municipalities to help combat some of the other infrastructure needs we have. Uh, as you know, Donald Trump has promised some sort of infrastructure bill. Uh, people are working on it. Uh, we have not collectively in Congress discussed it. I assume there will be an increase uh, in infrastructure spending in the next fiscal year compared to the last fiscal year. And like I said, right now the focus has been on DACA, the focus has been on the tax reform, and the focus has been on not a separate infrastructure bill yet. But I know it's being talked about, and I'll be surprised if something doesn't pass sometimes in the next six or seven months. Obviously, most of the infrastructure on a local level uh, should be coming from the state or locally. Um, I think it might be primarily at some major projects, but we will see. I think they're the same major projects for some that will free up some state money uh, for more money to local units of government. I haven't, I'm not an expert on the local state budget, but I think this year, you say work for the town or the village or you work for? Yeah, I work for the town of Algoma. Okay. Just north of here. I, I believe, um, I believe there was, at least by historic, terms, a larger increase than average for town road aids this time around? There was a modest increase. The, the yeah. amount equal to about five or six potholes. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, on a percentage basis, I know over time, and I'm talking back to my state legislative days, I don't think they always, for certain maybe political reasons, treated the towns as well as they should have compared to the major projects. That's kind of a, another issue. Um, but I know they tried to begin to move the ball in the right direction this time around, the state legislature. Well, when were, when were we slated to go to? Zoom? Uh, well, okay, we're over. Um, she did two more, yeah. Okay. John Haas? That's me. Our spokesman, Mike Hurt, covered. Uh, All right. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. And I won't dash out of here. I'll hang around and talk to people if they want. Dan Ballman? Yes. What are founding fathers reported in entering to uh, not attempt to quote them, but paraphrase the government covered the best and the government the least? Um, why is it that we send so much money to Washington to have? The federal government skim off a certain percentage of that money before returning it to the, to the people. Yeah, I, I mentioned a couple times you should never ever want the federal government to do things. And it's very frustrating. We passed a big education bill, the Student Success Act, uh, last session. And I was frustrated that it didn't go further as far as uh, giving more flexibility to the states. I had a private, no, it was a private conversation, I shouldn't say it. I had a conversation with a very high level person, uh, and they felt that the way to handle welfare is just block them into the states and get rid of all the, uh, get all the rules and all the bureaucracy. And for a variety of reasons why I didn't agree with them at the time, I'm kind of coming around to that being the best thing to do there. The reason they do it, and it's amazing the number of my colleagues who still like the federal government. I guess because they feel it's easier to get reelected if they spend your money on yourself. And I don't know what it is. You know, having been in state government, 
I always kind of viewed the federal government as a problem. I mean, again and again, you'd want to do something, and part of a part of a state responsibility or local responsibility was done with federal dollars, and as a result, we were restricted on what we could do or how efficiently we could do it. Um, but man, there are a lot of those congressmen who don't get that at all. They think that they have, you know, the federal government puts some money in the pot, and now we get to micromanage everybody. Um, I talk about it in Washington. Uh, even the Republicans, who you would think you're voting Republican, would be wanting to get out of some of this stuff. And even a lot of them, man, they just think it's the greatest thing to brag about the federal government doing some new thing. And you're right. They, they skim money off the top before they send it back. When they send it back, they send it back with all sorts of one-size-fits-all rules that are a pain in the butt to business or to local units of government who spend the money. You are absolutely right, though. I'm glad you brought it up. And uh, there are people around here who are going to ask, you know, for more federal dollars or these meetings. And they have to understand you're much better off asking your state legislator for more dollars than your federal legislator for more dollars. Instead of block grants, they should just get out of it? Uh, politically, that ain't going to happen. I understand, right. but that's what should be done. Yeah. Before I let go of the stage, I'd like to thank you for the town hall meeting, and I'd like to thank the, every one of the veterans here for their service. Thank you. And I'd like to thank the audience, by the way, for being such a good audience. Thank the veterans one more time. Okay, thanks. I'm not going to dash out of here if somebody wants to.